I am Ma Presta Ayen. The world has changed. Han Matho Ninen. I feel it in the water. Han Mathon Ned Kai. I feel it in the earth. Ahan Nostan Ned Gwilith. I smell it in the air. Much that once was is lost, for none now live who remember it. It began with the forging of the great rings. Three were given to the elves, immortal, wisest and fairest of all beings. Seven to the dwarf lords, great miners and craftsmen of the mountain halls. And nine, nine rings were gifted to the race of men, who above all else desire power. For within these rings were bound the strength and the will to govern each race. But they were all of them deceived, for another ring was made. Deep in the land of Mordor, in the fires of Mount Doom, the Dark Lord Sauron forged a master ring, and into this ring he poured his cruelty, his malice, and his will to dominate all life. One ring to rule them all. One by one, the free lands of Middle Earth fell to the power of the ring. But there were some who resisted. A last alliance of men and elves marched against the enemies of Mordor. And on the very slopes of Mount Doom, they fought for the freedom of Middle Earth. Victory was near, but the power of the ring could not be undone. It was in this moment, when all hope had faded, that Isladur, son of the king, took up his father's sword. Sauron, enemy of the free people of Middle-earth, was defeated. The ring passed to Isladur, but who had this one chance to destroy evil forever? But the hearts of men are easily corrupted, and the ring of power has a will of its own. It betrayed Isladur to his death, and some things that should not have been forgotten were lost. History became legend, legend became myth. And for two and a half thousand years, the ring passed out of all knowledge, until, when chance came, it ensnared another bearer. It came to the creature Gollum, who took it deep into the tunnels of the misty mountains, and there it consumed him. The ring gave to Gollum an unnatural long life. For five hundred years it poisoned his mind, and in the gloom of Gollum's cave it waited. Darkness crept back into the forest of the world. Room grew of a shadow in the east, whispers of a nameless fear and the ring of power perceived its time had come it abandoned Gollum but then something happened to the ring that it did not intend it was picked up the, by the most unlikely creatures imaginable a hobbit Bilbo Baggins of the Shire for the time will soon come when hobbits will shape the fortunes of all. The world of the Lord of the Rings may feel it's detached from reality as fiction and it can possibly get. But so much of Tolkien's Middle Earth is inspired by a based on real world cultures, locations and experiences. Beginning with the release of The Hobbit in 1937, the history and composition of Middle-earth was then developed exponentially in The Lord of the Rings, The Sumerian and various other writings by Tolkien that had been made public since the author's death. Tolkien's offer was such that a rich and detailed picture of Middle-earth through his prose that his world lives on almost a century after its inception. 
and arguably more popular than ever before. Moreover, Tolkien had virtually immeasurable influence on his best-selling novels and writers such as Terry Pratchett, George R. R. Martin and Terry Brooks and a major part of this enduring popularity in the vivid way in which Tolkien paints the setting of Lord of the Rings, which in extended sections of his appendices and numerous tables and maps and charts that Middle Earth is fleshed out into a land that many of us feel very familiar with as a country that really did exist. Due to the presence of elves, dark magic and small greedy halflings who eat, the, eat their entire body weight in food before lunch, many over the years have dismissed Tolkien's world as fanciful make-believe, but that doesn't really do justice to the level of the real world influence woven throughout Middle Earth. A professor of English language and literature, Tolkien incorporated much historical and cultural inspiration into his fiction, all of which helped make Lord of the Rings feel more realistic and compelling in the minds of his readers. I'll read some of the things that he actually wrote about and that we can actually relate to in real life. So, let's have a look at locations and cultures of Middle-earth. Tolkien admits in his published collection of letters that Middle-earth is intended to directly mirror Earth's approximate geography, with most major locations in the story representing a country of continent in the real world, both in terms of placement on the map and recognisable qualities. The Shire, for instance, is Tolkien's home of England. The idyllic gardens, plentiful taverns and farming lifestyle denote the stereotypical picture of rural England, particularly that in the 1930s. The Saruman scouring of the Shire is explicitly intended as a social commentary on the industrial expansion that took place throughout the mid-20th century. The author himself compared the Shire to a Victorian ear of Warwickshire village and also stated that his hometown of Sarah Hall acted as a visual reference to Hobbiton. The ethos shines through the Hobbit's simple, local, self-contained folk fairy lifestyle. Gondor seemingly takes its cue from East Roman Empire, Arnor being the Western, with towering, impressive architecture, a grand army and a history of colonising nearby lands. Although Aragorn is far from the traditional emperor stereotype. Both Gondor and the Roman Italy shared a rigid system of leadership whereby a single figure ruled without question over the entire empire. It's also pointed out that Gondor's history is close facsimile to Roman mythology story of Aeneos. In particular, Gondor borrows law and qualities from the Byzantium, including the warning fire beacons and a legend of a returning king that would restore the land's former glory. Consequently, the people of Rohan have been compared to the Goths, the northern Europeans who resisted a Roman rule, not graveyard-dwelling Marilyn Manson fans, of course. And Tolkien himself acknowledged the Byzantine influence on Gondor in one of his published letters. Relative to Gondor, Mordor would then line up with Sicily. And while few would suggest that this island hides an even darker lord intent on world domination, it's interesting that Sicily is home to the very infamous, infamous fiery volcano of Mount Etna, perhaps the most resound, sorry, the most resound, renowned and dangerous of the world. 
Strangely, however, it was another of Sicily's active volcanoes, Mount Stromboli, which Tolkien directly cited as the real world Mount Doom. Other less prominent locations in Tolkien's mythology also possess parallels in the real world. The Haradrim, for example, hail from a large continent to the south, heavily Im implied to the Middle Earth's Africa, accounting for their use of olf sorry, oliphants and tribal social structure. So let's have... Let's look at World War I in Lord of the Rings. Tolkien's experience as a soldier during the First World War understandably shaped his literally magnum opus. And it's no coincidence that Lord of the Rings centres around a war to end all wars. However, the influence of Tolkien's time in the trenches runs far deeper than the basic premise. The author's grandson, Simon Tolkien, notes several connections between the real-life horrors of the Great War and the struggle of elves and men against the great and seen evil. The industrial machinations of Saruman and Sauron used to manufacture and equip their armies are comparable to the lethal technology advances made throughout World War I while well, Simon likens to the bond between four main hobbits as a representation of the camaraderie between soldiers forced to spend days and nights in close proximity. Perhaps more significantly, Frodo's inability to return to everyday life after his experience in Mordor is said to be a reflection on how veterans would struggle to assimilate back into civilization once the war had ended. Tolkien himself insisted that the war of the real world didn't directly cor correlate to events or specific plot points in The Lord of the Rings and famously rejected in his works. But thematic comparisons are clear and certain other connections have been drawn over the decades. The dead marshes and mines of Moria, for instance, are depicted very much like recorded descriptions of World War I trenches, almost impossible to traverse and haunted by the lingering faces in the gloom. Tolkien's first stories of dragons came shortly after the introduction of tanks of the war, added to Lord of the Rings' critical undercurrent aimed at industrialization potentially the most telling manner in which Tolkien's personal experience arise in Lord of the Rings is through the harrowing imagery of the author using during the battle scenes in which Frodo is on the final leg of his journey to Mount Doom. Tolkien plays on all five scenes to create a clear, lingering image and his descriptions would apply to the trenches of the Somme as much as they do to the dark corners of Middle-earth. So let's look at Tolkien's languages. With a well-documented lifetime interest in language, it's little surprise that Tolkien invested much time in crafting his own dialects for the various races of the Lord of the Rings. And one of the most notable of these is Quenya, an ancient language spoken by the elves. Quenya is often likened to Latin, but this is more to do with its sparse usage in Middle-earth than its actual form of construction. The closest inspiration for Quenya was actually Finnish, furthering the Scandinavian influence on Lord of the Rings. Like Finnish in the real world, Quenya features wording similar grammatical rules and the two are extremely close phonetically. As Quenya's popularity died out amongst the elves of Middle-earth, it was placed by the more common Sindarin tongue, which fans are often likened to the Welsh language in its sounds 
and phrasing. So we then look to the orcs. Elves aside, most of the characters in Lord of the Rings speak of Westron, otherwise known as the common tongue. This language is essentially English, as far as the narrative framing is concealed. But Westron is in fact a language of its own. Tolkien was an expert in Old English, and this played a huge role in much of the terminology used throughout the Lord of the Rings. Even the phrase Middle-earth can be traced back to Old English term midden geard and Old English was commonly written in runes, the likes of which can be seen throughout Lord of the Rings. But the language is most prominently urged and used by the people of Rohan, demonstrating the more old-fashioned lifestyle compared to the Westron speakers. One of Tolkien's greatest skills was allowing these real-world influences to enrich the reader's experience, but without making them essential to understanding the plot. So to all your to Tolkien fans out there, what was your favourite part of the story of Lord of the Rings? Let me know in the comments below. Thank you for listening.